Okay. Welcome back. Now, this is a very short lecture in which I'm basically providing you with some homework to be doing. So in the last lectures, uh, we spent a good deal of time in trying to derive final rules for a specific theory defined by a Hamiltonian in the form of a quadratic term, which we took to be a standard term in the form plus a quartic term. Uh, this this is a standard toy model for physicists to learn field theory. It's sufficiently simple to allow you to focus on the most important aspects of the theory, yet sufficiently complex to require the same method that then you use on more complicated theories. In the context of statistical mechanics, it also has a uh, quite a relevance in the fields of, uh, say, for instance, uh, magnetization, and and it can be used as a prototype for phase transitions. So it has a number of applications. And we devise the Savima rules according to a specific procedure. Now, what I would like you to do is to learn how to devise Fima rules for uh, any theory, basically, as long as he has general properties like unitarity, locality, and blah, blah, blah. So in particular, I'd like you to spend some time on your own and derive his final rules for a number of Hamiltonians, which I will now write here. So the first final rule I'd like you to derive the rules for is one in which you have a similar theory, but now you have two types of fields. And of course, there are two different fields you must distinguish them by something, and in this case, I'm using two different masses here. And then I get an interaction terms that is this part. Okay? So this is my my first Hamiltonian. So how do you derive Fima rules for this theory? Of course you will have two fields now, so you will need two type of weak contractions. So for instance, this will be the two-point correlation function out of psi field. And then you need a graphical rule to distinguish this from another field. For instance, we might choose this to be for the other field. And I keep on putting zero here because correlation function, the degree, the correlated propagators are always for the quadratic part of the theory. So this one. Is. So if you remind, if you go back and and, uh, and look at the results we have in Vic theorem, then you should be realizing that, for instance, this guy here is basically in configuration space the opposite of this operator. Now, when I write a derivative in denominator Obviously, I don't mean I divide by a derivative, which something mathematically makes no sense. What I really mean is graphically the inverse of this operator. Okay? In the free theory. Oh, sorry, the inverse of this operator. In, in, in coordinate representation. Okay, so what are the final rules? And once you have the final rules, for instance, you can evaluate these correlation functions. For instance, I don't know. 
phi x1 phi x2 phi x3 phi x4 and write the diagrams to order lambda square now you might be tempted to say there is no psi field here because there is only phi field but as you immediately find out now I'm gonna write it and then erase it then you can immediately find out that you have you might still have contributions like this so although these fields are all phi's there could be contributions from psi fields in the material of the graphs so okay compute this is a is a nice exercise another interesting theory to be doing is one in which well let me keep two fields for simplicity i give you another example but this time i have a theory which is derivatively coupled so for instance i call it uh, psi di psi phi di phi and i'm using well i'm writing and then erasing the sum because i'm always using einstein's convention according to which anytime you see a pair of indices that is repeated then you implicitly assume a summing over these indices so whenever i see di di this really means sum over di di over i that's called the einstein uh, repeated index convention 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 whatever i don't remember the spelling convention well whatever you got it. Uh, those of you who have done general relativity know perfectly what i'm doing now, what i'm talking about now this is a theory with a derivative coupling so what are the vertices of this theory what are the final rules of this theory and in particular you might evaluate the two-point correlation function say just for a change for the psi field now in the full theory not in the free correlation functions and again you'll discover that there will be some kind of a interaction here which is different from the one where you don't have the derivatives of course okay so that's one thing i will not go through this in class i'd like you to force yourself normally these are questions i give at the exam uh, normally when I show up in exams, you know, the first question is a standard question, tell me about, I don't know, derive me the Wick theorem, and in the middle of the question, if the student goes very well, and you can see that, you know, he's, he's knowing, he's, he's done his job, his job, he knows the matter, then I typically say, okay, let's slightly give you something slightly different from what you're supposed to do, and let's see if you can react to that and adjust the demonstration. This is for the upper end of the student, so to say. And typically, a, a typical question I give, okay, I understand you understand, you know how to derive final theory, final rules for phi to the fourth. Derive it for me for this Hamiltonian here. Now, this year, uh, I have no idea how you guys are following the course. It's harder for me to assess how much the, the class is with me in the course. So I'll be a little bit less... Um, demanding at the exams and therefore i tend to anticipate the typical questions that i give but i don't give the answer so you have to work it out okay Fine. i'd like also to mention that in many cases we wrote things in perturbation theory but we did not worry about the fact that many of the things that we wrote could have in fact been infinite so let's consider, for instance, this diagram that appears in phi to the fourth theory, right? So if I were to write this diagram, I would write integral over z, because the position z is unspecified. This is x1 and x2. I will get a delta of z 
minus x1 or x1 minus e. There's no difference because in Euclidean theory they come with the modulus, so who cares? And then I will get a delta from z to x2. And then I will get a delta from z to z, which is obviously not something you want to evaluate because, if, for instance, typically all the deltas that we've seen, say in 3D, delta of x, comma y is e to the negative mx negative y divided by x y, and I think there's going to be one over 4 pi or 4 pi numerator. I think it's 4 pi numerator. Never mind. This is completely relevant for the, for the sake of the discussion that I'm having here with you. Now, clearly, this is already divergent the moment you, you, you plug in. So the way you do it, in this case, is, is by regularizing this divergence. So give me an example. To give an example, well, one thing you can do, you can put a z prime and send it to z. Or the best way to do it is to write delta of z, z, as a momentum integral, d thread p. So let me call it z prime minus z, this guy here. I'm splitting the two points with the idea of sending them to the same point after I understand what's going on. So I get 2 pi to the third. I'm considering uh, three dimensions for a moment e to the nay, i, z prime minus z p, p squared minus n squared, right? Or plus n squared, sorry. Now, this is a nice convergent, oh, no, sorry, this is a nice convergent integral of any time z prime is different from z because it's a Yukawa integral that we have already seen. But when z prime is equal to z, this integral goes to Integral over d3p over 2 pi to the third, moving myself out from here, and then I get 1 divided by p squared over m squared. And you immediately see that this integral cannot be convergent because this guy will go like p squared dp. So I'll get a p squared numerator, p squared denominator, and an integral over 0 to infinity in radial coordinates. This beast is clearly divergent when z prime goes to z. So what you really mean is that you need to regularize this integral according to some uh, prescription. And then after you regularize your integral, all the quantities you do are finite. And then what you need to do is First, write all the expressions in regularized form, choose a regularization cutoff, match at some scale your experiment with your free parameters, and then go ahead and use that, right? And in, in, uh, in statistical field theory, you never have in, in quantum field theory, especially in high energy quantum field theory, then you want to send the cutoff to infinity because you want your theory to represent the physical theory in a very, very large range of scales. That's what you do with QD. With... In statistical field theory, and then this raises the questions, uh, you know, a number of theoretical questions that I will not touch on in this course. Because in statistical mechanics, you never had the ambition to have a fundamental theory. At some point, if you arise the cutoff scale, you're going to enter a regime where your field theory simply breaks down because you start seeing the underlying lattice that condensed matter provides you with. So you simply cannot use field theory anymore. So the lambda is always an extrinsic parameter of the theory you can never get rid of. Uh, so this is to say that any field theory, in general, I believe any field theory, but in statistical mechanics, and statistical theory, this is never even a question. You have a cutoff, and that's it. So, for instance, just to finish my discussion, if I were to evaluate this diagram, what I would do, I would fix a cutoff scale, which I choose to be, say, I don't know, maybe 
fourth or fifth, that's arbitrary, right? Of the two pi over a lattice spacing, so that I'm sure that I have at least five lattice. You know, I'm I'm resolving many lattice five lattice spacing within the typical wavelength of my theory. So my resolution is not able, or in order of magnitude ten, is not able to resolve the inner structure. That's my UV cutoff, my maximum momentum probe. And then I can introduce, for instance, a Gaussian smooth cutoff, and I'm sending the diagrams d3p over 2 pi to the third, 1 over p squared plus m squared, 2 through the regularization procedure, d, d3p, 2 pi to the third, and then here I'm using e to the negative, I don't know, p squared over 2 lambda squared, 1 over p squared plus m squared. And I do this anytime I have a loop interval. So all of a sudden, if I do this, this, the new definition that enters here, will be this guy now. And in this case, this will only contribute to a number, right? Because uh, this is a number after all. So this will be a number that will depend on the cutoff number. And these guys here will become just a regular integral that you can solve. And if you cannot solve it because it happens to be divergent, then the, what you do, you go to momentum space, Fourier transform it. So do you define this as the inverse Fourier transform of its Fourier transform? So you're doing nothing, you're Fourier transforming back and forth. I'm not considering this because this is just a constant at this point. So I'm anti-Fourier transforming its Fourier transform, and then I'm regularizing this by putting explicitly a line. This is something you can compute. It's a Fourier transform of a convolution, which is nothing but the Fourier transform, the product of Fourier transform. And then you basically are writing the Feynman diagram in momentum space and regularizing it with an explicit cut. So, in order to practice and get handy with this, I suggest you calculate G2 X y you calculate this diagram explicitly introducing a cutoff, cutoff and you calculate this diagram explicitly they both appear in phi to the fourth this is along the lambda square but this is on the lambda by explicitly I don't mean you get a number at the end you get an expression, and you have you taken care of all the divergent quantities. I want to give a suggestion on how you do this. Then, okay, you have z1, z2. Once again, you start to say x1 minus z1. Then you have delta z1 minus z2. That's this one. I have another one, z1 minus z2, and I have a third one, z1 minus z2. So I have three powers of delta z1 minus z2, and then I have a delta z2 minus x, and then I integrate over z1 and z2. Now, this integral will include a configuration in which z1 is equal to z2, right? Because it's part of the integral. And that's where you, this guy will become divergent. Right? So this, this loop integral will contain possibly divergences. The way you deal it, you write it as a, as a Fourier transform, and you regularize the Fourier transform and move on from there. Uh, just as I did for the two-loop diagram. Okay, so what I suggest you to do, and I'm referring this to the entire class, try to do this. 
And if you cannot succeed, if you get stuck, write a small piece of paper, trying to use your hand script if you want, or use LaTeX, and refer to the group on exactly you where you, and how you got stuck. And we might discuss this either on a streaming or on a specific file, a specific video I will upload. But give it a try it yourself. Don't wait for me to do it for you. Okay? So give it a try to, to evaluate this diagram and this diagram to the quadrature level, to the point that you basically have simply uh, an expression containing only finite integrals, regularized integrals. And if you can do that, then you can do calculation in field theory. If you cannot do that, you're in the same situation or where you think you understand classical mechanics because you can write f equal ma, but you are not able to solve classical mechanics problems. So you're really missing the understanding. Okay? So I do encourage you to, number one, derive final rules for unknown theories. And if you get stuck, write it, and but not just say, I got stuck. Write on the chat of the group and say, this is what I've done. I don't know how to go on from here. That's the kind of input from you I want. Okay, I'm very happy to devise a new video in which I address questions, but they have to be questions following your effort to solve the problem. Okay, and also, number two, make an effort to compute any diagram you can think of, and I give you these two diagrams as an example, and to make sure you know how to regularize these integrals out, to remove the divergence. And remember, the trick is always that, go to moment, write, f of z as the anti-Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of f of z, and in the Fourier transform, when moment I enter, put a regulator. Okay? So if you do that, and you start doing calculation, you'll discover that this trick is always there. And normally that's, you know, all you need to remember is that the Fourier transform of a delta is a constant, that one can be written as a Fourier transform of a phase, uh, sorry, uh, you know, an integral of a delta, and blah, blah, blah. There are always these little tricks that you will discover if you try to do it. Okay? So, this is the deal. I'll be give you dedicated lectures on this if you give me dedicated effort on it. Okay? Bye-bye.